Wasn't it good to be in the house today, church? Come on. Come on. The Vikings game starts at noon. We'll be done before then. Unless you hang out outside and eat some donut holes, you can still catch it on your phone, though. Come on. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name's Travis. My wife, Becky, and I have the privilege of leading this amazing church. And like she shared, we turned six today. Six years. And... uh I, I got to say, so here's the thing. We, we are statistically an anomaly because most church plants, did you know that, that church planning and restaurant starting are the, the highest chance to fail? Starting a restaurant, starting a church, statistically higher. So guys, we're, we're breaking trends. Come on. Come on. On the real, I'm really, I'm really, really grateful for every team member, for every donor, for every person that has been able to just help see the dream that God put in Becky and our hearts just come alive. And I just want to say thank you. Thanks to those that are online that are watching. There's so many, literally hundreds of people that have helped be a part of this process. And we're, we're starting a brand new series today called Come Together come together. And the reason why I, I want to talk about this is this has been a, 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 a time in our country where there's been a lot of division, right? There's been a lot of division. There's been a lot of arguments. There's been a lot of disunity. Um, and, and I've just been challenged. And I was like, you know what? We're, we're celebrating our sixth year anniversary. And and what, Lord, what do you want to talk about? And I just felt like the Lord was like, I want you to share vision for, for what the church could be and what the church, what the church is called to be. Because I think that, that in this season, in this place that we're in right now, where if you turn on the television or you, you scroll social media and there's just, there's so much, it seems like so much disharmony. And I felt like the Lord was like, I am the solution. I am the solution. And the reason why you planted this church was to be a part of the solution for the conflict and the problems. And, and <coughs> excuse me, I preached so hard second service that I've been coughing all morning. You're like, Pastor, you have COVID. That's why you're like so far away. So we're good. We're in good shape. Um, but I... I, I've just been challenged by the Lord lately, and I was listening to this podcast, and it's this guy named Kerry Newhoff. He's this great, great uh, leader and pastor that teaches other leaders and pastors, and he was interviewing this pastor from uh, New York, and, and his whole family, this guy John Tyson in New York, he, his whole family got COVID, and he was talking about the challenges of that, and He's talking about having to go to church online and navigate through this. And, and he said something in this, and, and, he, and he, he shared something. It made me want to buy his book. I bought his book, and then I bought the book for our whole staff. And, and now I'm going to do a series about some of the principles on it because it was so good. I was like, wow, wow. And the book is called Beautiful Resistance, and it talks about how the church has the power and the ability to resist culture. And to be what the kingdom, what the kingdom on earth, you know, when Jesus prayed that prayer, God, we, we want to see the earth, we want to see the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. That's what the church can be. And, and so he's sharing about these challenges, and he's sharing about this, and he says something, and it just made me stop and think, and this is what we're going to lean in today. He said, I'm concerned that the church in America is going to miss the lesson that God is trying to teach us through this. It's like, wow. He said, I think that God wants to teach us something, that, that the Lord wants to, 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 to do something new in the church and, and wants to be a part of the solution for what's happening in our world. But I'm, so, I'm concerned that we just want to get past this moment, that we want to go back to what's comfortable and we want to go back to, to the, what's normal that, that we're going to miss what God's trying to teach us. And, and I'm not this guy who thinks that, you know, uh, like, oh, this must be the Lord's will. If I land this, it's going to be the Lord's will. 
Oh, it must have not been God's will. Like sovereignty, right? Like there's some people who believe that sovereignty is like, you know, that, but I believe that we have a free will, that humans have a free will, and that some of what we're going through is because of the sin that's in our world. Some of the sickness that we're experiencing is because of the fall of man, that our bodies have been corrupted. And, and so you think about COVID, like I don't think that COVID like was authored by God. However, I think that COVID has been allowed by God. And I think that God is going to use this season. And, and he said in this interview, he said, what if God, because think about uh, through that, you, you have COVID and then you have a financial uh, recession and then you have the civil rights movement that has been started. And, and he said, he goes, I don't know that we would have paid attention if we weren't in quarantine. I thought, wow, what a statement. If everyone in America wasn't glued to the TV or their phones because they had been in a pandemic. And, and he said, what, what is God trying to teach the church right now? And, 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 I, and, and I think that this is something that we got to ask ourselves. And I need you to ask yourself this. What is God trying to teach you? What is God trying to teach me right now? I think that the Lord has something in mind. And so let's dive into the word to, to, today. So again, our series title is Come Together, and we're going to start in Acts chapter 2, and this is the birth of the church, and you're going to see something beautiful here. So Jesus has died, and he's, ro- he's risen from the dead, and he gives instructions in Acts chapter 1 about what to do, and, and he says for them to wait, and so they get baptized with the Spirit in Acts chapter 1, and it's also describes that, and and sorry, in Acts chapter 2, and then you see this, Peter preaches this sermon, and thousands of people are coming to Christ, and then at the end of Acts chapter 2, before major persecution set in, because what happened was, after this, major persecution set in, and the church was scattered, but before that, you see this picture of people coming together, And so let's read it. Acts chapter 2 in verses, uh, we're going to start in verse 42, and we're going to read through verse 47. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. I love this word right here. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need, and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. And they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord, this is our favorite, this is the pastors and evangelists' favorite scripture in the Bible right here. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So here we are, six years into our birth as a church, but 2,000 years later, and we see this beautiful picture of the potential of what the church could look like. And I just want to remind us what we're here for. I want to talk about why do we need to come together? What do we come together for? And just today specifically, we're going to talk about this, that we come together for God and for each other. We come together for God. So the church is not just for you. It's for, our, it's for God. Did, did you know that? The church is for God, meaning it's a place where he can show himself to the world. It's a place that he can show himself to you. And so the church is for God. It's, it's created for him. Jesus said that I will build, uh, I will build my church upon what? Uh, upon Peter making this confession that Jesus was the Christ, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. So what was that? What does that mean, the, the confession that Jesus is the Christ? God was giving Peter a revelation of who he was. And the church is, what is it? It's the expression of who God is. It should be the expression of who God is. 
It's the bride of Christ. It's, it, it's, it's, it's something significant and special. And, and you know, God didn't have to use us to be a part of expressing to the world who he is, but he wanted to. He chose us to, that we get to be a part of it. And there's these incredible things. Can I just tell you right now, these five verses that we read, this is what our world desperately needs. We need community. We need, to, we need a sense of awe and wonder. We need to invite God into our mess and our brokenness and, and ask him to do something that he can only do. We don't just come together for God. We also come together for each other. And this is tough. This can be tough. And it, it, because the reason why this can be tough, and our first point is that, that our worldview can, re- can really mess up our, our unity. Our worldview, it can keep us from unity. And, and what I mean by that is you have an idea of how life should be. You have an idea of, of how the world should be. You, you have a perception. You have a, a viewpoint. We all have this. And part of this, our worldview, it comes from our parents. It's, I was reading and uh, actually doing some research about this, and it says about 60% of our worldview comes from, like, our caregivers, we, or our grandma, or grandpas, our, our, the people who pour into our lives are, has a lot to do with where we were raised and, and how we were raised and what we were taught to believe. If you were born in a, another country, if you were born in Iraq or Iran or Germany, you would have a different worldview than you have. You and I have, we have an American worldview, and, and for me, I'm from Texas, so I'm, I know we got some Texans in the house today. Come on. The great state of Texas, I was taught that you, you need to, before you say Texas, you say, the great state of Texas. Someone asked me, what, are you going to bring some food over? I said, I'll bring some biscuits and gravy over. Let's go. Um, like, the great state of Texas. Anyway, so what? That influenced my worldview where I grew up. And then 40%, the rest of your worldview comes through your peers. It comes through where you currently live. It comes through uh, some of your experiences shape your wor- worldview. But you and I, we have one. And so you've got this church, and you even look at Acts chapter 2. There were all kinds of different nations represented there that day when the gospel was preached and and thousands of people came to Christ. And there's a lot of different worldviews. But our worldviews, even though uh, I think that our mission can align us, but our worldviews can divide us. Our, our mission can align us and our worldviews can divide us. And, and so this last year, I just have been determined that Today, it's our six-year anniversary, and I'm going to share a little bit of the challenges that Becky and I have gone through. This last year has been literally the hardest year of my life, and it's not because of COVID. That's a part of it, but it it was just, it was like, and and when I was preparing for this message, I felt like the Lord said, I want you to be really honest with your church. I was like, I don't want to share about this. It's, It's our birthday. Like, let's just party. Like, and the Lord was like, I want leadership in the church to be what the world longs for. Transparency. Honesty. Just talk about what's going on. You don't have to hide anything. And, uh, and so I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to bear my soul on our anniversary. And, and, and so when I say it was the hardest year of our life, it, 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 for me, it was just partly because we've, we've been through some stuff this last year. And December 30th, I, I felt like the Lord started speaking to me. And so I wrote down this, this really was a long word. And at first I thought it was just for Becky and I, and then later realized this was for our leadership. And now I'm sharing this with our church. But December 30th, one of the main primary things that God spoke to me was that this year, that 2020 was going to be a year of pruning, a year of refining, a year of removal. Come on, no, no pastor likes to hear that word. A year of removal, a removal of everything unfaithful and unfruitful. And that through this, that a, a distinct DNA would emerge, that vision would rise 
And that's what I believe that we're at this point where God now is, is aligning us. But I want to share a little bit about what's happened uh, for the sake of transparency for you to know. In, in some ways, if you could, this is like the state of the church address. If you could know where we're currently at and where we're going. But before COVID even hit, we saw some of the greatest growth as far as numbers were concerned on a Sunday morning that we'd ever seen. 350 people, 415 people on a Sunday. It was like, woo! But I have to say, even though in March that we were seeing that kind of it, I don't know that our culture, well, I do know, our culture wasn't what God wanted it to be. We weren't healthy. We weren't. And what do I mean by that is there was a lot of complaining. There was a lot of grumbling. There was a lot of, you know, we don't like this music or we don't like that song or we don't like that message or your message has changed or we like being able to have picnics at Blue Stem. And uh, come on, I like that too. That was amazing. Like, uh, you know, just a lot of different kind of complaining. And then there was some division. There was some arguing. There was some, and some people started leaving because of that. And so even though you may not have even noticed that because, like, the rooms were full and we were seeing new people come, and, but Becky and I were like, what do we do with this? How do we navigate through this? And then COVID hit, and we had to switch everything to online and try to figure out how do you people, get people engaged spiritually when they're just fighting to survive right now or figure out what's what, and all of a sudden all the the people who send their kids to public school become homeschool parents and like you know it's like dude it like in a day we had to figure out how to completely do church online so we saw a lack of engagement for there so that's one thing and then the next was probably the most devastating to me is that during the time mother's day i'll never forget the the weekend of mother's day the holy spirit said you're going to you're going to preach about Ahmad Arbery getting shot. And I remember wrestling with God going, yeah, I'm willing to do that. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid because I don't know the answers and I don't know the solution. And I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't have the right words. And God was just like, I need you to trust me. This is my church. And I said, okay. And so we preached on that and shared on that, talked about you know, the, the riots happening in Fargo the couple weeks after that, George Floyd's death, and just decided as a church, you know what, we're not going to shrink away from this topic. There's, there's a group of people, our black brothers and sisters, our brown brothers and sisters are grieving. We're not going to shrink away from this. The Bible talks about this, and so we're going to, this was an issue in Jesus' day, and so it's going to be an issue in ours, and we're going to take a stand, and I thought, I just got to be honest, I thought people would be excited that we were a church that was going there and I never got more negative feedback on a sermon in my entire life pastor you're taking your cues from this from the media pastor systemic racism isn't real and I was like have you read the good Samaritan like you know like uh, and and it was it was just hard. And can I tell you, part of it was hard wasn't just because it, was, it wasn't nearly as hard or painful as what my brothers and sisters that were grieving going through. Like, but it was hard because there were people in our congregation that had these thoughts and these ideas and these worldviews, and they were contrary to Scripture. And, and listen, can I just challenge you that if your worldview doesn't align with Scripture, give God the right to change it. And, and, and we, we lost a lot of people. I don't want to tell you a number, but people that were my friends, people that I love, people that I cared for. And Becky and I, like what had to happen in my life was just the idol of pleasing everyone had to die. And I just had to say, God, until my last breath, I will preach what you tell me to preach. This is your house. And, and it's been uncomfortable and it's been hard, but can I just tell you, we've also seen new people that come and they're like, hey, we've heard about what you're saying and what you're about, and we want to be about that with you. And there's, a, there's a, this, this a DNA that's emerging, and we want to be a church that's for everyone in our city, not just for some people in our city. And the people that have left in this process, I'm sure there would be people sharing this online. Did you see what pastor said about you? Here's what we say. We love you. We bless you in the name of Jesus. And we hope you find a church where you can thrive 
and live on purpose, and you will always have a home here. However, we will preach the gospel. And if it challenges your worldview, let it. Come on, let it. Look at the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses, verse 5. It says, for though we live in the world, we, we don't wage war, war as, as the world does. The weapons we fight with are weapons that aren't of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? A place where the enemy has authority. Uh, and, and I just see so many different strongholds in our, in our world that need to come down. So, man, so much division that needs to come down so that Jesus can be king. Listen to this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What do we do with these strongholds? What do we do with these worldviews that are contrary to the scripture? We take them captive. And what do we do? We make them obedient to Christ. Does Jesus have the right to change your worldview. Are you taking things captive? Am I taking things captive? Am I making them obedient to Jesus? Because, guys, we need a transformation to happen in our minds. And Romans chapter 12 talks about this verse too. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you, that by testing you, maybe discern what the will of God is, what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. Can I just say, there's some, there's some things that happen when we let God renew our minds, when we realize that this house, it's for God and it's for each other. And when we do that, there will be some results. And I just want to talk about that because when Jesus is king, when he's king in his church, things happen. There's results that happen, and, and I'm just going to go through them. They're, they're, they were what we started with. We devote ourselves to the word of God. Starting in October, October 1st, we're going to start something new, and we're combining this with our confirmation classes, but I'm going to go live on Facebook, YouTube, if you're not on the Facebook, and, and uh and I'm going to teach just some different foundational things about God's word. And so for eight months, once a month, we're going to teach on these things. And you can choose to talk about these things with your family. Our confirmation students are, are going to talk about them and, and discuss them. The first topic that we're going to go through is what, what role does the Bible have in my life? I think that's a really important question that we need to be asking ourselves right now. What role does the Bible play in our life? Why, does God, why did God give us the Bible? Why does it matter? So look at these. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were listening to what was God doing. What else, what else happened? They, they, you can put up the next one. These are results of Jesus being king. Miracles happen, right? A sense of awe and wonder. Come on, I need a miracle in my life. Do you need a miracle in your life? I want awe. Like, I want people to come to church and go, wow, God was there. Something took place. I went in there struggling with this one thing, and God snapped it off my life. I went in there with this sickness, and God just healed me. I want to see miracles happen. When Jesus is king, miracles happen. People's needs are met. Wasn't that cool? To see that they were sharing and there was a sense of community. One of the things that we were doing, I talked to Dennis Wilmer about this very thing because he was sharing like, Travis, how do we know that, that what the needs are in our congregation? It's a great question. That was a great question to ask. And so there's, I saw this church, they had a board in their lobby, not like a governing board, guys. Some of you like, oh, we're, we're going to just have another board. We're creating another. No, we're not doing that. Like, like a board like that shows like what are needs that we have and what are needs, you know, someone could take that need and go, I could meet that. We had, I, I was at someone's house yesterday, as an older, older lady, and, and I saw this, this curtain rod that had been disconnected and it was over her, her stairs. You know, for me, that might, not be, that might be super easy to fix, but for someone, they could put that on the board and go, you, someone could go over there and fix that. Come on. You're like, that's not a big deal. It is a big deal to her. She can't hang her curtains there right now. Right? Like, do you have a need? Do you have a need? Because when Jesus is king, we are here for each other to help meet each other's needs. What else happens when Jesus is king? We, work it, we worship together corporately and privately. 
People worship in their homes, and they worshiped in the temple. Both are very essential and important. We need to worship together, and we need to worship at home. And what's, the, what's another one? Our hearts are full of generosity and gladness. So if you're like me, and you get on the internet, and, and, and you look at like kind of this cancel culture that, we're, that the world is obsessed with right now, in some ways it's like you get on there and you go, what am I going to be offended about today, Right? Like you get on, on Facebook and it's like, what am I going to be offended about today? Or, or, hey, can I just give you some practical advice? If you're struggling with that, there's something on your, you know, maybe you're watching it on TV or hearing the news and you're just overwhelmed. There's this thing, it's called the off button. The off button, right? It's also on your phone. Like I took a month off social media. It was beautiful. So good for me. Just turn it off, guys. Just turn it off. Why? Because God wants our hearts full of generosity and gladness. I think that that, that, that generosity is something supernatural. For God to teach us to get out of ourselves and care about other people. Come on, I just want to challenge you. How can you be this... How can you be generous this week? And look at that other part. Their their, Their hearts were full of gladness. Anyone else in the house need some gladness? Man... Seems everything's so depressing and oppressive. But when we know that Jesus is king, regardless of of corona, regardless of who's president, Jesus is still king. Come on. Regardless of of all these, these things that are happening right now, come on, let's lean in and listen to God. Holy Spirit, what do you want me to learn in this season? I'm not going to shrink away from this discomfort. I'm not going to go back to this place of comfort where I'm ignoring what's really going on underneath the surface. I think America's so good at just pretending everything's fine. We're blessed. We're God's country. And it's like, come on, there's things we got to repent of. There's idols that need to be smashed so that Jesus can really rule and be king. And I just, I don't, I don't want a church that... That on the outside, it seems like everything's going great, but on the inside, we're just selfish, entitled people. I don't want that. I want to be the church that washes people's feet and grieves with those that are mourning. And I want to be the church that looks at the world and goes, how can we help? How can we help? God Bring us that sense of joy that comes from knowing that you're king no matter what. Look at this other result. We have favor in our city. We have favor. The Bible says that there is favor on them. What what is that? Favor opens doors that shouldn't be opened. We've seen that. We've seen that in our church, the doors and relationships and people that we know that we get to have friendships with. And I, I think that's important. And the last is that the world comes to know Jesus. Did you notice that when I started this message, I, I said that we come together for God and for each other, and I didn't say the world. And, and that's hard for me because I love to just preach mission and love to talk about the world because I do believe that we exist to help people know God people that don't know God, people that are far from God, we help to know them. But the Bible says, and there's there's a chronological event that happens in these five verses. The Bible says that that's the last thing that happens, is that the Lord added to them daily. What does that mean? Jesus is responsible for the growth. We're responsible for everything else. We're responsible for devoting ourselves to the word of God and and letting Jesus be king over our lives. And we're responsible for generosity and taking care of each other. We're responsible for, for praising God. We are responsible for our relationship that we have in our city. And are we gonna be a church that our city is proud of? Like, we're responsible for our reputation. God's responsible for the growth. He's responsible. We Listen, can I just tell you right now, you are responsible for the person sitting next to you in the house. And we got to get over our awkwardness. We got to get over our, our, our entitlement and being so freaking busy that we can't make time for each other. We got to make ourselves available to love and care. Because I believe that God 
wants to bring more people in the house, but he doesn't want to bring more people in the house if we're just going to be entitled. So can we just do something? This is the last thing. Can you just stand to your feet? Lindsay, can you come play the keys as we close? This last point, and this is so good. A church that loves God and each other attracts the world to Jesus. A church that loves God and each other att- attracts the world to Jesus. We're just going to end with some prayer. Could you just close your eyes? God, I think there's things in our lives, there's worldviews that's caused us to, to not love each other the way that you want us to love each other. There's worldviews that, that have caused us to not care about what our world is going through. God, there's, there's things that the church in America needs to repent of. Entitledness and selfishness and the love of comfort and caring more about what songs are, are saying on Sundays than the fact that our neighbors are struggling. God, help us and forgive us. Lord, start with me. Start with Becky. Can I just pray, Lord, that you would just break us so that your anointing would flow. Lord, we don't want to be in the way of what you want to do in our city. So we turn to you. We look to you. And we love you, God. We love you. And we just dedicate this house. This house is for you. This pulpit is your pulpit. You can say whatever you want to say. You can do whatever you want to do, God. We are here for you. And Lord, we dedicate our homes and our cars and our resources and our talents and we just give them to you again and say, God, do what you want to do. We trust that you're going to do incredible things when we love you and when we love each other. And I pray you'd give us your love that you have for each other. That you'd unify us. You'd help us to know you. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord and you can't say that Jesus is king, we want that to change. We're going to give you an opportunity to pray. We're going to pray with you. We still are in an attitude of prayer. Every head is closed. Every eyes are closed. Every head is bowed. But if that's you, you say, I need Jesus to be king in my life. I just want you to be bold. Raise your hand. See, that's me, pastor. Come on. I see that hand. Anyone else? Yes. I'm proud of you. Church, we're going to pray for those that just said they want Jesus to be king in their life. Would you pray with us, church? Say, Father, thank you for Jesus. I receive the work that he did for me by dying on the cross. Please fill me with your love, your purpose. Help me to focus on what you want me to focus. I confess that Jesus is king over my life. In Jesus' name, amen.